So in this session, we're going to look at some theories about change management and try to give you some hints on how to successfully implement your own changes. I'm going to start off with Bain & Co, one of the largest uh, and most highly respected management consultancies in the world. They work with lots and lots of big blue chip companies, and they've got a whole division devoted to advice on change management. And I'll quote their research extensively as we go. And as you can see from the screen, their figures show that 20% of major change efforts fail completely. Over two thirds settle for less than 100% of their stated ambition, and only 12% actually meet their goals. <clears throat> And what's easy to see is that generally, and I, I am generalizing, most people don't like change. Getting people to see the upside of something they don't feel very keen on can be hard work. It's rather like taking year three on a five mile hike. So most changes begin with a vision of the end goal in mind. And so does our wonderful five mile hike. You gather your team together, you lay out your plans and you begin to put it all together and implement it. But along the way, your year three children begin to push back a little bit or resist. Some get moody. Some don't like the feeling of being outside in the rain. Others may even grow tired or overwhelmed. And some might decide they don't even want to participate any longer. But you know that if you can help them reach that successful destination, the hard work is worth it. And just like the children in year three, your staff will feel uncertain when faced with something new. And of course, for quite understandable reasons. They'll ask, is it really necessary? What if I can't do it? What if my subordinates are better at it than me? A root cause of resistance to change is that your team identify with and care for your organization, as we said in part one. People fear that after the change, the school will no longer be the organization they value and identify with. And the higher the uncertainty surrounding the change, the more they anticipate such threats to the organizational identity they hold dear. Change leadership that emphasizes what's good about the envisions changed and bad about the current state of affairs actually fuels these fears because it signals that the change will be fundamental and far reaching. Counterintuitively then, effective change leadership has to emphasize continuity. How what is central to the who we are as an organization will be preserved despite the uncertainty and changes on the horizon. In overcoming resistance to change and building support for change, you as leaders need to communicate an appealing vision of change in combination with a vision of continuity. Unless they're able to, you're able to assure people that what defines the organization's identity, the, what makes us who we are, will be preserved despite those changes, you're going to meet a wave of resistance. Now, senior researchers in business schools throughout the world recognize that bringing about change can be difficult. One of the most famous theories came from a guy called John Cotter in 1996. He was a Harvard Business School professor and a renowned change expert. And in his book, Leading Changed, he introduced an eight step model of change, which he developed on the basis of research of a hundred organizations, which were going through a process of change at the time. The book's around 25 years old, but still contains some key principles adopted by change managers today. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to look at his eight stage process to help us manage change better. Now, as you can see on the slide, there are eight key steps to help you through three phases. You have to create the right climate, the black section on the slide. You have to give people the tools for the job, green section, and then you have to embed what you've achieved. That's the top red section. So let's break all that down into a little more detail. The first step is all about building the desire for change. How do you engage staff when there is this natural resistance? How do you develop a sense of urgency around the need for change? You have to find a way of getting a critical mass of your team behind you. And that's not just as simple as showing a set of plateauing test results or scaring them about your next inspection or the demands of a new curriculum. In the ideal world, we're looking for a positive motivation, not one of fear. And this will be more straightforward if the staff trust you 
and believe in you. And if you've done the work that I described in session one, you'll be a long way towards that. Now, you need to have a very clear and succinct rationale for why this change needs to happen. You need to have undertaken a comprehensive and thorough research programme so that you have all the evidence both for and against so you can talk to your team and effectively answer their questions. These are worried people, they will have questions. Your idea has to be easy to describe to a range of audiences across the school. Some people say if it takes longer than 30 seconds to explain, it's actually probably too complicated. You need all parties to feel able to subscribe. So they need to know the philosophy and the rationale for it, because people will only buy in when they see the need. Ensure it's in line with your school development plan. Ask yourselves, why on earth are we doing this? Can we afford it? And what are the pitfalls of not achieving it? In starting, some practical advice I got from one company in my research was, was this. They said they started by creating literally a visible room in the school to manage the transformation programme and create what they call a change canvas with the senior leadership team and the governors. On flip chart paper, they wrote down in non-buzzwordy language why the change was happening, who was affected and what the benefits were going to be. They next put up a feedback area next to those big statements and let each member of the school poke holes in it. And because this was anonymous, it gave the executives and the feedback uh, and the change team really useful feedback. To create the right climate, successful change leaders take four steps to help people succeed despite their discomfort. They start by identifying the employees most affected. They target those employees with early, effective communication that explains the reasons for the change and creates a clear picture of the destination. They provide the dedicated leadership attention and support needed to manage the shock of change. And notice the word support there. They treat other leadership members themselves as targets of the change. In the earliest stage of a change effort, successful organisations ensure that the leaders who will lead the change are completely, utterly and totally on board. We're going to listen now to a guy called Alan Bird. He's an advisory partner with Bain's Results Delivery Practice, as he describes the risks of change and how senior leaders can manage those risks by answering three basic questions. And I apologize that the sound quality on the film isn't fantastic. It's a bit of a cliche, but it's still true that most change efforts fail. And the primary reason why change effort fail is because we all tend to focus on delivering what we set out to achieve. We don't necessarily look at what it takes to realize the benefits. And the best example of this I can give is trying to buy the, the home gym kit to help you get fit. It's a good start, but if you don't change your behavior in terms of using the gym kit on a regular basis and putting it in place in part of your healthy lifestyle, nothing's going to change. And when we talk to CEOs about how to make people change behaviors, we ask them to face into just three simple questions. The first is, the what. What is it we're trying to achieve and why is that important? Now clearly it's important to get the right strategy or the new operating model, organizational system, new, new ways of working. But that's not all you need. You need to bring people along with you so they understand how am I meant to behave differently to deliver this new strategy or operating model. We often call this the beach. And the reason we call it the beach is because when you're going on holiday with your family, you don't try and excite them about where you're going by going through the detailed itinerary and saying how we get from the home to airport and airport to hotel, etc. We show them the iconic picture of the beach or the mountain or whatever it might be. But as organizations, we get this wrong. We typically show them the plan of how we get there. We don't show them and demonstrate why is it important to them to get to, to the beach. The second question is the who. Who's going to drive the change? Now, many organizations get this wrong. We get this wrong as consultants often. Because you try and set up a change office to drive the change into the organization. And a colleague of mine once said the most important lesson that I've ever learned about how you manage change, which is you can't appoint someone to be a change sponsor. Change leadership is a function of the line. And the reason that's true is because we're trying to change behaviors, 
the person who has the greatest influence on someone trying to change their behaviours is their direct boss. And for that direct boss, it's their direct boss. And this creates a spine of leadership which will drive the change into the organisation. Now, that's not to say there's no use to a central change team, but one of the most important roles of that change team is to, to support the line in its function as responses of change. The third question is more about the how. How do you get there and what might get in the way? And one of our core beliefs is that change risk is entirely predictable. It's measurable and therefore it's actionable. Now that's not to say that change risks are the same in all cases, or even that change risk doesn't change over time in any one transformation. But it does say that over time we've recognized the bank of change risks that are likely to occur and can put in place the simple and pragmatic actions to mitigate against those risks. What are the three risks we see most often? Probably it's number one, not being clear on your beat so you can't bring people along with you. Number two, you haven't got an effective spine, so you haven't got the organisation supporting the change process. And number three, you're trying to do too much through that spine, far too many initiatives, not necessarily ordered and sequenced, and you're trying to do business as usual at the same time. So if you want to increase your change odds of success as a CEO, just ask the three questions about the what, the who and the how. So the key actions you have to take there are know your who, your what and your how, and show your team the beach. Where you'll go wrong at this stage is actually believing that everyone sees things the same way you do. Never underestimate the desire of your team to stay comfortable and stable. Next thing you need to do is get your staff involved. Firstly, brief and train your leaders at all levels so they know what's coming, what to expect and how to communicate it to those next in their line management. This is known as an enrolment cascade. At each level of the organisation, starting with the most senior people, management holds meetings to explain how leaders reach their decisions and to ask for input in areas where it's needed. The sponsor at each level leads the meeting explains the change and requests feedback. And because this is done throughout the organisation, it's important to ensure that everybody's touched and that everybody hears about it from the person who matters most to them. The person with the standing to be their sponsor, typically their direct supervisor or line manager. Then reinforce this with messages from peers. So imagine if you were trying to bring in a new IT initiative, then you'd form a working party of a wide cross section of technophiles and technophobes from lots of different departments or year groups and have them meet regularly and then feed back their progress to the staff meetings. Get this group to support and encourage colleagues. Try and get some staff influences on board as well. If your staff gang leaders are with you, the others will soon follow. So you need to really build a group who believe in the project and get them to operate according to their skills, not to seniority in the organization. Beware though, because once you hand over this part of the project, you need to keep a really close liaison with your group to ensure that the organizers stay on message, excuse me. <clears throat> Some practical advice. When you consult on a particular change, Remember to thank everyone who's taken time to provide feedback. Welcome their input, even though some of it may be negative, as providing opportunities for people to get things off their chest. That's an important part of the process. Then go visit other schools to see what's actually working and what isn't working. Ask them lots of questions. Ask if they were doing it all again, would they do it the same way? And refine your plans in light of this new information. After a consultation, feedback what you've heard. And if you've decided not to act on some feedback, explain why. And it's often best to do this face to face. You will need to be prepared to be flexible in order to take more people with you and still make the change you want. Sometimes there is a bit of compromise needed in there. And think about relating this to the, uh, this project to the vision of your organization. If you don't have a vision, get one. You need a catchy line to remind everyone why we're doing what we're doing. Business guru Simon Sinek has written widely on this. He says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. For Sinek, the why is what calls people to action. He says visions fail because people don't understand. He says, we tend to know what we do, we tend to know how we do it. 
But visions fail because not everyone understands why you were doing it. Sinek says that decisions to buy or follow or act in certain ways are controlled by the limbic part of the brain. And people will only decide to buy your product or follow your idea if they understand the point of it. So communicate this reasoning when you sell your vision. If you can't, you have to wonder if the change you're planning is actually the right one. And many major corporations have taken this to heart and produced a why statement, or as you might know them, mission statements or vision statements. So for example, ASOS wants to be the go-to fashion destination for 20-somethings globally. That is their whole raison d'etre. Tesla aims to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport by bringing mass market electric cars to market as soon as possible. Every decision made by that company is to facilitate that vision. Your school needs a vision it can operate on too. Let's take a couple of minutes to play a game. Whose visions are these? You don't need to shout it out if you're feeling shy, you can just think it through in your own head, I don't mind. Which company uses these phrases to drive forward its mission? Inspiration and innovation to athletes. Nike. It is indeed Nike, yes, well done. Inform, educate and entertain, that might ring a bell. BBC. You're on the ball here. The, the Earth's most customer centric company, that's a bold statement, isn't it? Anything you might want to buy online. Amazon? No. Amazon. <laughs> yeah. And to organise the world's information. Google. A lot of people say that. Yeah. It's actually Facebook. Oh, wow. <clears throat> but you were on the right lines. Google again. <laughs> A better everyday life for many people. So you need a vision that your people can subscribe to. Let's just recap then. So the first three stages in our journey towards managing successful change are about creating the right climate, showing the vision, getting the staff to see the rationale and getting them to buy in. You can use their keen or experienced colleagues to pilot systems and show the worth of new ways of doing things. So in schools, that might, might mean having a working group when you instigate Google Classroom or move from computer rooms to trolleys of iPads or introduce that fantastic state-of-the-art math scheme from the Far East. The next one, the green section, we're going to move on to now. First thing you've got to do is communicate your vision. Your message is going to have strong competition from all the other day-to-day -day pressures and priorities that you have in running a school or an organisation. What you actually do is often far more important and for many more believable than what you just say. So if you want to communicate your vision, demonstrate the kind of behaviour you want from others. You need a mantra. How about something like, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. If you say it often enough, it worms its way into the psyche of your team and they start to believe it. Mercilessly over communicate your key messages until everyone is on board. Speak to people, use social media, proclaim it in your staff meetings and at your governor's meetings. Get that pilot group of colleagues you've got to do the same. Under communication is an absolute disaster at this stage. You have to stay on message. You have to get it out there. And the next thing to remember is that your colleagues, of course, are in the middle of a fundamental change, which is totally disrupting their lives. In high stress situations like this, people typically can process that's 
hear, understand and retain only 20% of the information they receive. And studies have shown that attention spans are compressed. In fact, full attention lasts 12 minutes or less in these conditions instead of an hour under normal circumstances. So that means the messages about important changes have to be themselves shorter, crisper and simpler. And in situations where they must deal with change, employees want to know that you care about how it will affect them first before they hear your message about the details of the impending change. Not everyone realizes that. The trouble is, of course, companies and schools too typically fail to treat communication during times of high stress as anything out of the ordinary. Companies tend to rely on institutional channels like webcasts, newsletters, or company-wide emails when people want to hear directly from those in charge. Another common mistake, management teams often use language that people can't understand and process in times of stress. I'm talking about dense, jargon-filled terms. Too many organizations simply don't train their leaders in clear communication, as we saw in part one. You need special, high-stress communication to allow those affected by the change to actually hear the message. Now, change leaders adjust communication methods in three ways to manage how what is actually a shaken workforce will perceive the information. Firstly, keep the message concise, clear and brief with a positive focus. Instead of seven points, you might boil things down to just three key elements. Speak for no more than 12 minutes. Secondly, they quickly establish themselves as trusted, credible and empathetic messengers before they even launch into their key message. Employees we hear typically decide within the first 30 seconds if leaders are credible and trustworthy based on their perceived level of caring and empathy rather than their expertise and competence. And thirdly, People must hear the information from managers they trust one on one. And this is where the relationship building we discussed in part one comes into its own. There was one large German company who were going to emerge with another. Initially, they relied primarily on an emailed newsletter and website to communicate the details of the merger and the pending integration. Instead of arming supervisors to communicate directly with the teams. When they later polled nearly 4,000 employees on the effectiveness of the integration strategy, less than half said they'd understood the specifics of the change. And that's a threat to any integration effort. The company adjusted its approach, went face to face, person to person, and immediately saw improvements in employee perception. I'm going to go back to Bain again now, those management consultants. This guy is called David Michaels. Uh, and he's going to summarise some of the key points we've just made there. Most companies that launch major change initiatives fall well short of achieving their stated ambition. In fact, our research suggests only 12% succeed. Why is this the case? Well, it turns out that organisations don't change. People change. And this is often overlooked by management. In fact, there are three very common myths that hold leadership teams back from achieving their full potential when it comes to change initiatives. The first is that the, the feeling that change is somehow irrational and hard to predict, when in fact the reality is that it is predictable, it is manageable, and there are tools and techniques that can be used to get out in front of these risks and to put mitigation plans in place. The second myth is that as long as we minimize the change on people, we're going to be okay. When in fact, the reality is it's our job as leaders to help people to get through that change process as quickly as possible, not to avoid it, it doesn't work. The third myth is that in order to succeed, all we need is great leadership and solid day-to-day -day management. The reality is that while that is important, uh, the rules of the game change during times of, uh, of disruption, and they're sometimes counterintuitive. We understand from the world of behavioral science things like people only are able to process 20% of what they hear when they're feeling disrupted. Things like they care much more about who the messenger is versus what the content is of what they're hearing. They care that people care more than they care what they know. Things like reinforcements are four times more impactful 
in affecting someone's behavior than the triggers right up front. And so the routines that leaders build up over time during normal periods of sort of management uh, style are, are different during times of change and need to be adjusted accordingly. Busting these three myths will increase the odds of success. Now there comes a point when talking's not enough and you actually have to start putting things into action. Plan well ahead and think carefully what resources, structures and systems will be needed. Will staff need training or new skills? Consult with others and keep testing how the ideas are being received out there. Is anyone resisting the change, for example? Are there processes or structures that are getting in the way? If you can be like the member of the curling team that brushes the ice to smooth the path of the stone as it travels, you'll help your project by eliminating all the potential barriers to success. Use your pilot team and any new converts and get them to use their strengths to share the workload so no one's overburdened. To put it another way, you need to change the systems to fit your new vision. And don't be afraid of trying new ways of using your enthusiasts. If you don't brush the ice sufficiently well, then your curling stone will stall before it gets into the circle. The bigger the personality of the objectors at your school, the bigger the negative impact they will have. Work on them hastily, either by using their friends in your pilot group or by being more forceful if you need to be. You've got to decide how much this matters to you. Steve Denning, in his book, The Age of Agile, which I'll mention more in a few minutes, says to change minds, start with inspiration. Use information, and if all else fails, move to intimidation. Next, create some quick wins. Look for ways for short-term victory. That could be a month, a year, depending on the type of change you're putting in place. Staff will want to see results, so you need to be able to show, showcase some fairly quickly. Identifying these can be part of your initial planning. If there aren't any, or they take too long to be visible, your critics and negative thinkers will start to shout that they were right about things all along, and this will impact on your progress. Also, find a way to celebrate and reward those who are on board and making a positive difference. As we said earlier, everyone likes to be rewarded and your staff need to quickly be thinking that the change is a good thing. After a sufficient period of time, if you have evidence that the impact of the change hasn't delivered, show the strength of character to acknowledge this and find another way forward. That doesn't mean your vision wasn't, was wrong, just that part of your planning may have missed something to help you get there. So from what I've said so far, any thoughts on which of these could be most important in facilitating change in an organisation? Well, actually, they're all pretty important. As Mary Lippitt showed back in the 1980s, the absence of any one element can lead to confusion or anxiety or frustration and doom your project to failure. So for example, if you don't have the vision, your staff are gonna be confused. If you don't give them the skills, they're gonna be anxious. You can give them the vision of the skills, but if you don't incentivize them, you'll meet resistance. They could be completely on board, but if they don't have the right resources to do the job, they will become frustrated. And finally, you need an action plan, otherwise you're just gonna face false dawns. You need all these things in place to facilitate change. Right, review. We've sold the vision mercilessly. We have empowered others to act on our vision and we've identified and celebrated some quick wins. So are we on the right track? Well, phase three is a tricky one. How do we stop our change initiative from becoming just another one of those here today and gone tomorrow projects? You see, the staff see things very differently to us and we have to be aware of where they are in their journey. Lots of studies show that in the early stages of change, the moods, the morale and the productivity of our staff will actually drop before rallying later. There's a famous graph called the Kubler-Ross change curve that illustrates this and it's on screen now. Initially, staff may be shocked that the change is actually happening. That's why we need to spend time on creating the right climate early on in the project. As things become dif different, some may show frustration. Remember my analogy with the year threes on the five mile hike. And this is the point at which we have to keep pushing the mantra and maximizing the communication. At this time, members of your team will be at a low. And that's when we need to bring in our pilot group or their trusted line manager to give them some care and attention and show them how things can be better. Then, some will begin to experiment and see benefits and that will be shared. We may need to develop capability with some through additional training, but then we're on the home straight.
For phase three, we have to build on the change. We have to keep the momentum going. And Cotter argues that change projects fail because victory is often declared too early. Quick wins are only the beginning of what needs to be done to achieve a long-term change. And if you spent time properly defining how the change will work in the earlier stages, these should be easier conversations. Now, from personal experience, I've got to be honest, this is where I've gone wrong in the past. I know in my busy job as a head, I've had many other things that needed to be kept up with and to be done. And I've sometimes taken my eye off the ball, thinking that the project's own momentum would carry it forward. It never does. As soon as you stop pushing, the people who still haven't got it in their psyche will revert to their old ways. You have to see one project through before you start the next. And with each win or benefit from the new system, you increase the momentum of the project. Keep espousing your mantra and reward those staff who have helped. If you give your key people a stake in the organisation with a role or promotion or a reward, they will back you and will work on their colleagues for you. You then have to get your systems fully embedded. And this always takes more time than you would like. Keep consistently applying your new values, keep stating the mantra and building where you need to go next in your development plan so it's clear for all to see. As Benjamin Franklin said, a failure to plan is a plan for failure. You can't just let projects roll on. You have to also build in monitoring to check that you're reaching milestones and that people are implementing everything in a consistent way. If you don't monitor it, then different departments or subjects or year groups will all add on their own little interpretation and soon the message and the benefits will get diluted. To embed and gain acceptance, show your team the links between the new way of doing things and some new successes. Again, keep espousing the values. Ensure that you put the right people in the position of responsibility so that they can work on everyone else. You're pulling the strings, other people are doing the work. So the key phases in Cotter's model. Create the climate for change. Enable others to feel part of it and then sustain what you have created. Keep those three things in mind and we'll see that in action now. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. 
It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Now, there are all sorts of interesting other sessions coming out of this, looking at exactly how you can launch a campaign, work with your staff and so on. But the following idea from that video, I think is very good. Uh, a guy called Andy Buck writes a lot of good sense about education leadership, and he came up with this checklist as a reminder of the key steps in managing change based on Cotter's model. But of course, these theories were all created in the 20th century. The challenges facing us now are slightly different. The rights and expectations of our staff are certainly different. And so the way we work as an organization has to be different. So we're gonna look now at some contemporary theories. <clears throat> Steve Denning from the US published a book in 2018 called The Age of Agile, in which he points out that our world has indeed changed. He says that companies in the 20th century were focused on making money for the firm and its shareholders, but now the obsession is creating more value for customers. Profits are the result, not the goal. Previously, individuals would fulfill particular roles and report to their boss. In the 21st century, he says, we're now drawing on the full talents of a staff, often through small self-organizing teams working together in short cycles. And there used to be a vertical hierarchy, but, but now it's all about horizontal networks. Leadership used to be from top to bottom, but now it's visible at every level based on human to human relationships. So here's a bold statement worthy of a session on its own. Denning argues that there's no longer a difference between leadership and management. In the 21st century, management and leadership are fully integrated. Both management and leadership have a service function and collaborate to create value for customers and users. In effect, leadership is an aspect of management rather than something above management. He has a point. There's no point in having people in your organization who are inspirational if they're not backed up with actual working systems on the ground. He says that if you want to inspire uh, change, you should use inspirational storytelling. And this links with the video a few minutes ago. He says, slides leave listeners dazed. So don't just make your staff sit through a PowerPoint presentation, especially if it's just bullet points and figures. Pros tends to remain unread. So newsletters and long emails won't on their own help either. Reasoning often inspires a contrary reaction. What's common sense to you can be the destruction of someone else's fragile ecosystem. When it comes to inspiring people to embrace some strange new ideas about change, storytelling isn't just better than the other tools, it's often the only thing that works. And at the same time, Denny argues, it's worth noting that most leadership stories don't in fact work to inspire change. The stories that most corporate executives at least tell are ineffective or even counterproductive through lack of storytelling expertise, highlighting once again, the need for communications training. The main characteristics of leadership stories that do work are as follows. Your story's got to be authentically true. There's great danger in telling stories that omit crucial pieces of information. For example, I can truthfully tell you that 1,200 happy passengers arrived in New York after the Titanic's maiden voyage. Now, when you discover, if you don't already know, that the Titanic sank, of course, the pushback you're going to give me is going to be devastating. I've clearly warped the story. The story must be positive in tone. Negative stories are useful for getting attention, but they won't inspire sustained change. Leadership stories we tell need to be told in a minimalist form. Don't say more than you need to. So as to spark a new story in the mind of the listener. And this is what we said earlier, particularly in times of stress or disruption. If you as a persuader can manage to tell the right story in the right way, the story can resonate and it starts to become your audience's own story as they begin to realise that the idea in question can open up new possibilities and opportunities for their own lives. If things go well, they'll start to tell their colleagues and friends of the story of the new idea and with luck it can start to spread in a viral fashion. And Before long it's on its way to becoming part of the culture of the organisation, a bit like Dancing Guy. 
Now, I can't give you specifics on this. This comes down to your own personal leadership style. Denning says that the provision of the right information at the right time is also key. You need reliable and objective metrics to show progress. And if all else fails, don't be afraid to get tough. This is the intimidation strand we mentioned earlier. And by this, he means the power tools that we have as leaders of coercion, of threat and punishment to move those who are most stubborn. Now, beware, though, because whilst these can be effective in the short run in forcing some sort of compliance change, they can lay a really dodgy basis for future implementation. Uh, they must be used sparingly, otherwise you'll store up problems for yourself. Now, another guru on these matters is Daniel Cable. He's Professor of Organisational Behaviour at the London Business School. And he agrees that the old paradigms governing change no longer guarantee success. He too knows that change just doesn't happen from the top. He says, to be successful, we must firstly understand change. Today, the basis of change is small changes in human behaviour rather than grand organisational changes. It's a matter of hundreds or even thousands of individuals acting in new ways. And by this, people inside a firm bring about organisational change that customers can see and respond to. Now that takes leadership to make the changes that have a beneficial effect. Good leaders build up the employees' individual patterns of behaviour to create substantial organisational change. You need to understand your workforce. These days, our teachers are more sceptical, questioning and sophisticated. They're more cynical and educated than previously before. They're more aware of the world around them, of the struggles that the world is facing. They have a value of self and their lives outside work matter to them. Go for a bottom up approach if you can. That change in employee awareness demands a different kind of management. Good ideas cascaded into the workplace he says, clearly aren't going to cut it anymore. Change is, in a sense, more of a group activity, one that can come up from the bottom up. Leaders have to provide their employees with hope, purpose and encouragement to try new things. Like Denning earlier, Cable says leaders can provide a sense of common purpose by engaging their workers with stories, stories about how their collective efforts will create a better tomorrow. As we heard Earlier in session, leaders must also coach their teams. They must make certain that the workforce knows that making change will be a struggle. It will take time and it might not work perfectly. There is a learning curve. Like any coach, leaders have to encourage people to push on through. That's what coaching is all about. Next, as a leadership team, you must encourage your team by emphasising again and again that they should focus on the purpose that the end result will make what they're doing going through worth it. But purpose aimed at the long term these days is rare. And as we said under Cotter, you have to promote the desire for change. Promote change with the people who actually have to change, who have to work in new ways or do other perhaps quite difficult new things. Collective action is about a common sense of purpose, and it's up to you as a leader to convince your workforce. You've also got to make them believe that innovation and creativity must take place in an organisation for it to remain competitive in the long term. Leaders have to give their employees the belief that change can take place and that new ways can help everyone to succeed. Now, if you look around you, this is actually a straightforward bit. My school, for example, was founded in 1552. And it certainly wasn't the same organization in 2020 that it had been nearly 500 years ago. It had been through major curriculum change reform. It had moved site. It had changed its pupil profile by going co-ed and taking in pupils from the age of three. It had adopted technology in its day-to-day -day work, yet it still retained the core values of its founding fathers of excellence, civil relationships, and collaborative working. Cable suggests suggests that culture matters. The only way to build an organisation that's change ready, adaptive and resilient is a psychological approach, not a strategic one. Organisations work best when there are hundreds of people looking every day for ways to do things better. And finally, Cable reminds us that change just keeps coming. 
because the world changes and competition keeps challenging us and the nature of the changes we are, we are facing are themselves changing. Another contemporary view on change comes from the people you've heard of already, uh, the team at Bain & Co that we saw earlier. Now they've pointed out some startling truths about our organisations and the people who work with us. I picked up the following from a series of articles by David Michaels, their Tokyo partner, who you saw in the video earlier. Excuse me a second. To pick up on the London Business School points a moment ago, Michaels argues that change is itself changing. Firstly, research has shown that the frequency of change and the degree of interdependence we experience today are both new. Previously, periods of dramatic change, such as the introduction of the steam engine or radio or even cars, were followed by periods of relative stability. According to Bain's work, the periods of stability we've grown accustomed to were about 50 to 70 years long. In the last 20 years or so, however, new technologies have upended and destabilized that model beyond belief. Today, there are more ways the world can change. And because we're increasingly interconnected, that change is spreading faster. Change is no longer a project with a defined start and end. It's continuous and it's accelerating. On average, employees now experience three major changes a year compared to with fewer than two just 10 years ago. And nearly three quarters of organizations expect more change initiatives to come in the next few years. A big changer is artificial intelligence, AI. That's changing the nature of jobs and shifting work that humans once did to machines. And it will in schools too. It necessitates a broader rethinking of the future of work. Yes, some jobs will go away, but many will be created too, requiring smart management through this period of immense dislocation. Now, Amazon in 2016, for example, increased the number of robots it used by 50% from 30,000 to 45,000, securing a reduction in its costs and delivery times. Yet, over the same period, it also increased its human workforce by 50% to focus it on tasks requiring soft capabilities that would help to better serve customers. And this requires that companies cultivate an ability to retrain their workforce in new skills on an ongoing basis, and that's schools too. The need for talent with advanced technical skills is far outstripping supply. In 2018, a study from IBM, 60%, 63% of respondents cited a lack of technical skills as a barrier to AI implementation. In response, an increasing number of forward-looking companies are now building cultures of continuous learning. They focus on developing both advanced technical skills and the human skills that go along with them. It may be true in your school too, how many thought they'd be delivering a lesson on Teams just a few weeks back? Now, the very nature of the workforce is itself changing. Millennials already account for nearly 50% of the workforce and they are reshaping expectations. Over 90% of them expect to stay in a job for less than three years, far less than the historical average. And at the same time, the so-called gig economy is contributing to a labor market characterized by non-traditional, independent and short-term working relationships. And we see that in schools with a rise in temporary staffing appointments. One third of all US workers have had some type of gig arrangements in place recently. Organizations' boundaries are becoming more porous. Increasingly, it's not just about the internal, but also the external ecosystem, comprising new kinds of talent, flexible working arrangements, and external contractors and advisors that define an organization. And again, the same is true in schools. Now, in this much more flexible environment, one thing has not changed, human nature and our desire for stability, predictability, and purpose. And in a world of increased uncertainty, company culture and mission are becoming a new source of stability and purpose. We see a swell of organizations pivoting from shareholder value as their sole raison d'etre to a focus on broader purpose. A survey of 12,000 white collar employees conducted by the Energy Project in the Harvard Business Review found that employees who derive meaning and significance from their work were more than three times as likely to stay with the organization the highest impact of any variable examined. Now, these employees also reported almost twice the job satisfaction and were significantly more engaged at work as well. And that gives better customer service. The scope 
of these three shifts is massive. Bain suggests that we now adjust to a future in which change cannot and should not be managed. A new normal, no longer defined by risk and fear and avoidance, but rather by possibility, agility and opportunity, tells us we must no, not just manage change, but rather embrace it. And this was amplified by a guy called Robert Schaffer in the Harvard Business Review recently, when he said, change management is not some occult subspeciality of management. Every day, we need to do things in our organizations, increase sales, streamline departments, implement new legislation. Each of these everyday tasks is managing a change. What we need to change is in fact our thinking. Leaders should view change not as an occasional disruptor, but the very essence of the management job. I won't read you the rest. You're quite capable of reading those. But in other words, if you're managing part of an organization, you're already involved with managing change. So we've looked at some classical theories of management. We've looked at some contemporary lessons on change management. And what on earth can we pull out of all that? Well, I'm going to leave you with five guiding principles that I think make good change management. How you can move from implementation to realization and repeatability. And these five guiding principles contribute to consistent and predictable results. Firstly, help individuals to succeed. They're panicking. They need you. They need your support. Organisations don't change. People do. To get results, individuals have got to behave differently. So identify the vital few behaviours that produce the most results and reinforce them consistently. And invest in coaching. Develop solutions that are credible and create pull rather than push for the change. Bring the future to life for your people. Create a clear and compelling story about the future to ensure that all the team, particularly the leaders, are aligned and committed to enrol the entire organisation. That's about your beach. Develop leadership talent and ensure that your leaders work effectively together. Use your leaders to inspire deep commitment. Build that healthy sponsorship spine you heard about earlier. Develop a process to cascade commitment along that spine to the front and activate your key influencers. Shift communication to a two-way dialogue. This new educated workforce won't just take instruction now, they need to understand why they want to talk to you about it. Deliver the value. Develop a realistic transformation plan based on your organization's capacity to absorb change. Realize that different sizes of organization and different cultures in organizations of the same size will affect the rate at which you can proceed. Establish a governance structure to ensure effective, efficient decision making and measure progress based on goals attained, not just on installing the change programme. And build to sustain. You're going to have to modify people's roles. You're going to have to modify structures and cultures and adapt information technology systems to support the change. Plan ahead and realise that. Establish feedback loops as well and response mechanisms that allow solutions to evolve as needed. If something's really not working, you need to know about it so you can make a change. The good news is, as we've heard, that risks are predictable and measurable. Anticipate the risks, focus on actions that reduce them at each phase of the change. You might need to take a bit of a hit in the short term to obtain your longer term goals. A bit like this guy. Yeah, no, no, no. 
And finally, we learnt a lot about change management from the Apollo moon landings. It's all in the planning. If, if you spend enough time in the early stages, the later stages will go much more smoothly. Thank you for listening. I hope you found that useful. I'm going to hand back over to, uh, to David now.